Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. There we go. What's up, everybody? My name is Indy, and this is Indie Game Business. The gentleman over there, all the way on the other end, is Mr. Jay Powell. And in the middle, we have Chris Zakowski once again, back for more marketing, because marketing is different in 2020. Yeah, yeah, we're completely changing everything. Everything is different. Well, no, there's there's like a lot of a lot of things have evolved for sure. Well, one of you the know? things that I keep seeing is when you write a check or sign anything official, you don't abbreviate twenty because it's easy for somebody to come in and write like twenty nineteen in it or you know falsify your shit. Well, so, you shouldn't yeah. have done that last year either. I know. That's why I don't understand why it's a big deal this year. Why all of a sudden it's a big deal? I mean, because if you wrote 19, people could make that 1990, 1998, or whatever yeah, they wanted. going to cash a check from 1999. <laughs> <laughs> like... Anyway, so we wanted to get Chris back on the show. He was on several months ago talking about the research that he did and the why people buy games on Steam and why they don't. And since then, he continues to pump out just fantastic articles on marketing your indie game so i reached out to him and said hey you want to do you want to come do it again and he said yes so we're all here so thanks chris appreciate you signing up for this again i i'll be here anytime i'll be like your steve martin like i'll just show up the five timers like, club um, i guess yeah, that's Larry on the daily show back mm -hmm. when you know, John Stewart was doing it, and whenever they didn't have somebody, he just called Dennis and said, "Come on down to the show and talk about something." So that's, that's me. But, just call me for something, and I will show up. The the wonderful thing is, there's so much good stuff that's going on. All right, so tell me, how has Return of the Zombie King done? Not great, which is what's going to bring up our next point. That's uh, I think what we're going to talk about. <laughs> All right, so I, I'll I confess. Is, um, I mean, it, it found it. Uh, it's got great reviews, uh, very positive, ninety percent positive reviews. Um, I just don't think it has a market. I kind of uh, I, I knew I was getting a little risky. I was taking in a, a mobile game and trying to get it for the Steam audience, and. Um, I think really what you need to understand before you make any game is you really have to understand that product market fit. You know, the the game really has to appeal to the audience so that they can say, like, this is this type of game. And um, I think that's kind of what spurred me to write this article about, um, you know, doing some market research and market analysis to kind of see, like, what are the types of games playing? Because even if you make a good game, it might not just be the taste profile of the audience you're serving. Which is key, you know, the, you'd like to think that with as many gamers as we have out there right now, any game would be a good fit, but that's not always completely the case. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was just reading about Supercell, you know, the, the huge mobile game, you know, they made Clash Royale and everything. They just canceled the game because it just wasn't, it didn't have the right sauce, you know, and even if they can't get the sauce right, you know, we can't, <laughs> like, what are, what are we ever going to do? So well, it, it really is, there's just some fundamentals about your game that just make it hit and feel positive, or it just doesn't quite catch in the market. It has nothing to do with how quality the game is. It's all about just the taste profile. The general stat that we see with companies like Supercell is they release one game for every 10 games they start working on. And wow. so they'll do an initial round of, they'll take all the ideas and they do an initial pass at the idea stage. And then they mock up gameplay and they cut a bunch of them then. And they typically take three games out of that 10 that go to pretty much an advanced alpha, I guess you want to call it, but they build out a lot of stuff, but then, yeah, they'll kill it. And it's not just them. It's a lot of these big mobile companies that do that. And so there is a lot more to it than a lot of people think. And it's good to, uh, it's good to bring that knowledge down from the triple A's to, to all the indie folks as well. So let's talk first about like your competitive analysis, you know, right there and see what, did you do what didn't you do? What should someone do to go and do a proper competitive analysis when they're brainstorming this stuff? Yeah, I mean, okay, to start now, if there's some 
died in the wool indies who are artists and 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 looking at this and they're thinking oh my god i'm gonna sell out you don't there's always the first thing that you start with is you say what can you make like what skill set do you have I mean, I mean actually you should really start with what you're passionate about what kind of games you like now i have a i have a word doc full it's a 75 page google doc of just ideas for games so i've got tons of games but most of them aren't practical you know like nobody's gonna want them but me so i I have tons of ideas. And so what I do is I cut those down to ones that are like, I can actually implement. And then this competitive analysis is to kind of find out a third ring, which is which one does the market actually want? So it's not like I'm trying to focus group my ideas. I'm just trying to prune down the crazy stuff that comes out of my brain. And so <laughs> with this competitive analysis, what I'm doing is I'm basically looking at what sold recently and that kind of genre and really that kind of um, you know, type of game. And so what I did was, there was an article published about two weeks before I published my article, and this guy scraped Steam, and he looked at the review count, because there's actually a pretty interesting correlation where you can draw how many reviews a game has, times its price, and you, and you can kind of get a ballpark of the, the amount of money they made. Now, it's not going to get down to like the thousands or the cents, but you kind of get the order of magnitude. Like, that's what I'm interested in. Like, does it make $1,000, $10,000, $100,000, or a million dollars plus? That's all I'm concerned with. I want to know that kind of range. And the reason I want to know that range is so that I can budget my stuff. Now, my games, the way I, I like to release a lot of games. Now, I'm not interested in making a million-dollar game. I don't care. Like, I'd love to, but... You're not going to turn the money away, you know? If it... I'm not going to turn it away, but I'm shooting for a game that makes in the 10,000s, okay? So I like to do this competitive analysis to look at this, find games that are in the 10,000s of dollars range. And what this guy did was competitive... He, he scraped all the steam, and you know, there's a calculation you can apply to estimate, the, like I said, the magnitude thousands, ten thousands, millions, that kind of range. And so um, what I did was I looked at the games that were in the genre I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of making a roguelike, which is a whole other thing. So I just pruned out all the roguelikes, and I just got all of them. And people think, the, the other good thing about doing this competitive analysis and looking across game is you just kind of see like how, what the games are. And when you print it down, it comes out, there's only like 500 to 600, I don't know the exact number, but it's like 500 to 600 roguelikes. That's actually not that bad. Like, you know, we think, God, it's, it's such an inundation of games on Steam, but 600, I can, I can mentally wrap my brain around 600, right? It's not like I'm facing a million competitors. And then what I did was I looked at his analysis to kind of find out, like, okay, what games made in the 10,000 range, right? Like, the tens of thousands, between, like, 999, 9,999 to 99, I just saw the quality of those games and the type of games. I'm like, okay, these are the type of games that kind of make in that thing. You know, do, I, do they match my quality? I downloaded some and I played some. And so that's kind of how I did my analysis was just to kind of look at, at that range of games, just kind of wrap my mind around it. And then I looked a little bit above and I looked a little bit below. And the idea was just to kind of game out or model what the type of games are making that kind of money. And that's, that was the core of what my article is about and what I kind of played out. So what about, I mean, it's interesting that you bring up roguelikes because one of the things about a roguelike is that it lets you, there's a lot of replayability in it, just simply due to the fact that they're built. Is that a factor that you think through when you're looking at, you know, how are you going to generate, you know, that $10,000 mark? Because... Obviously, the more the longer a game can be played, and more people can interact with it and share it and stream it and all of that sort of stuff, that's going to have a very positive effect on your, you know, sales down the road. So, does that factor in in terms of you know doing this competitive analysis, or is it more of this is the game I want to make right now? Let me see if it's worth it. It's a, it's a little bit about one. I think the market bakes that in. So when you look at, at least my hunch is, when I look at these, uh, this data set that I was looking at, which is all the games, and I'll I'll send you guys a link to where you can view the data set. It's very important. It's every game on Steam. It's a forty-seven thousand line long spreadsheet of every game. There's only four. 
I mean, again, there's only 47,000 games on Steam. I know that only. sounds like a lot, but when you look at Amazon, there are 8 million books. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. That's the number of books on Amazon is 8 million. That I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of 8 million books. I'm not afraid of the number 47,000. So when you look at this 40,000 line table, you, I feel like the market has baked in replayability. Now, there are some games in that list that are, in that roguelike list, that don't have a lot of replayability, but they still had something that got them to that kind of $10,000 range, which I was looking for. And so I think that's kind of baked in. Now, what I do is I, that's a very quantitative look at the data set, just to identify what's in that range. I then do a qualitative research, which is, I just went, I really bought a lot of games during the winter sale. I just bought a lot of games on that list. And the qualitative side of it is I just played them and said like, okay, this game that advertised it have a lot of replayability. I went and played it and said like, okay, what are the game mechanics that make it replayable? So to answer your question, Jay, like I think the market is kind of baked in when you see those numbers, like, okay, they like this type of replayability. Well, what kind of replayability do they like at this quality level? Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so you're in the article you wrote, you actually brought up some of these games that didn't have huge marketing support, but did very, very well. Like, is it Dung Greed? I don't know how they actually yeah. pronounce it. I mean, it's, it's a terrible name. I mean, but they did okay with it. <laughs> I mean, but here's the thing. Here's the reason I did it is mentally, um, there's like this logical, um, I, I don't know. There's this like aspect of it where you just don't, um, you can only keep so many games in your brain. And if you say, oh, roguelike, 2D roguelike, which is what I was studying, you know, like, oh, Dead Cells, um, Rogue Legacy, you only hear about the big ones that get all the press, get all the attention, they're the bells of the ball. You know, they're like, they're the ones that everybody thinks of. But there's this whole subclass of games that are super popular that don't have that zeitgeistiness to them. And that's really what I was trying to do was really do my homework and find out there are hidden gems in here. <laughs> have you guys watched that movie Moneyball? Read the book. <laughs> the book's good too. Money, Moneyball, they basically looked at players, the Oakland A's looked at players that weren't good looking guys. They were kind of fat. They were like, they, they weren't great, but they, if you look at their stats, they really, they get on base. Like they just, they're just like, they just show up to work, they get the job done and they go home and they're not like, superstars and i'm looking for not superstars people don't talk about these games they don't think they're awesome but they capture something that players love and that's really what i was looking for and i knew that if i just read press articles or postmortems i wouldn't get that detail and that's what when you look into the numbers and you do the calculations you find out all these boring games like dungreen which was one i was like who's ever even heard of that yet it makes more money than this game called um that is like an, a darling Sun, uh, Sunless Gods is the one you mentioned. Yeah. Well, like, think of GDC Talks. They're mentioned by the press. They're in top games of the years. Doug Reed doesn't make any top of the game list by any critic, but it just, like, punches above its weight. It just, like, gets, it shows up, gets the job done, makes its money, people love it, and then it just goes home. You know, it's like, it's it's not there for the, the, the press or anything. So that's what's interesting and why I think anybody thinking of making a game, look into the numbers and dive past what you hear the like on Twitter, what you hear on the press, what you hear on the stuff. There's this whole like subclass of games that just nobody talks about, but everybody plays. So, wait, we got a question. Oh, okay. Nightwolf well, is in the okay. house. What's Sorry. up, Nightwolf? <laughs> um, Nightwolf says in from Twitch. Um, in regards to replayability to extend gameplay time, what do you think of story games with large <laughs> multitudes of side quests with a short main story? As in extending gameplay time, there is replayability or content. But the current most used options seem to be roguelike or mini side quests. Well, okay. Um, I mean, is he talking about roguelikes that have story or story based games? I do not know. I, I, to kind of address that, like, if he's talking, if this person's talking about story based games, do the analysis. I only, I only studied roguelikes because I was going to make one. So you go look at story-based games like this data set and we'll link it below if this is below or is it this way below but whatever wherever it is we'll link to it and what you do is you take that 
and you look at story-based games, like identify your story-based game, and then I use the tagging to identify. Like there's a tag called roguelike or roguelike roguelite. I looked at both tags, but there are story-based tags. So you do the analysis, look at the numbers. You, you've got to do your own homework. I don't know that. But once you find that, you can see like, okay, are they making a thousand dollars, ten thousand, a hundred thousand? And that's where you can kind of just get a gut check of this. And that's that's what you really that's just what you do. <laughs> so oh and and, and news, Andy, we're actually live on LinkedIn. I All don't right. know why it's working now, but it is. So we've already got a lot of stuff coming in there. Twenty twenty oh. for the win. Yeah, so apparently that works now. So, um, John, on LinkedIn, we're going to link the data set below. I'll post a link to Chris's article. Um, I don't see the chat from LinkedIn for some reason. I don't, it, it's in there, I promise. It's on the restream. Oh, it's, it's not a, on restream. Okay. It doesn't show up on restream. Well, hi there, uh, LinkedIn. So... <laughs> Do you have any insight, and, you, and, and I'm not expecting you to, but do you have any insight into how these games did what they did? You know, how did they capture something in that zeitgeist that the PR people and the streamers didn't? Because, you know, in the article you mentioned Dungreed and the reality behind the fact, I think when you wrote it, you said they were $5,000 behind the total amount of money that Sunless Skies made. And Sunless Skies is, you know, a huge game. We've had Hannah uh, and several of folks from Fail Better on the show before. Yeah. But they don't have to share their money with anybody. You know, it's not like they're going through a publisher and the publisher's taking a cut and then somebody else is taking a cut and blah, 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 on down the line. All of that money's theirs. Is there anything that you uncovered that showed why the games like that ended up doing well? I I did, haven't done that part yet, but this is where the qualitative, qualitative side goes into it, where I'm gonna contact those, like I'm doing the analysis, the qualitative where I look at each person. And then what I wanna look at is like, go chat with the producer of Dungry and say, look, what happened? How did you do it? And they're like, oh, it's probably some Chinese streamer or something. You know, it could be something that's out of my control. I really, it's up to you to go network with those people and see if they're willing to share the secret. Like, and maybe they said, oh yeah, we just post it every day on LinkedIn. Like what? LinkedIn is a thing? Like whatever it yes, is. Yes, LinkedIn is a thing. Yes. I know, I'm representing the new LinkedIn folks joining our chat here. Uh, no, but what it is, is that's the qualitative side where you're like, okay, there was something magic here with this game. Let's chat with them. And maybe they said, hey, we just spent, I know we. it looks like we made a million dollars, but we spent $900,000 on it on user acquisition. So we really only netted out $10,000. And they're like, oh, okay, that's why. You know, and then you, you got to look, you got to talk to people. Unfortunately, we got to talk to people. So. <laughs> That's the next step after this is once I now analyze the games to go out and talk to the people and see if they're willing to share some of the secret sauce. <clears throat> because it, it, it is, it, <clears throat> there's always going to be this unknown factor. And so when we talked to the guys at Metacritic, not Metacritic, Megacrit, about a year ago, right after <laughs> Slay the Spire took off, you know, they were right place, right time. They didn't do a huge marketing push for it, but somebody in China saw it and started playing it. And all of a sudden, you know, everybody's downloading this, this stuff. So, and, and I love the fact that you brought up Moneyball because it's one of those things that I was fortunate enough, this is like 15 years ago, one of the founders of the company that I was at was all about analytics. And that's before analytics became like anything <laughs> big in the industry. But, you know, he made us all read Moneyball. And for those of you who haven't read it, it's basically the story of the Oakland A's and how they were in dead last place. But the guy who was, I don't know, the GM or whoever drafts people. Billy, at a baseball uh, team. Billy his name is Billy Bean. Billy yeah. Bean is the guy. So he would draft and trade for people that he could get really cheap 
but he was looking at their statistics and a deep dive on their statistics. And so it's the very same as, as, as indie games. You go and you actually do some research, you find the, that diamond in the rough. And what, you know, Oakland would do was they would, they would bring them in and, and they would improve. And then basically they would trade them off for a profit. So, you know, and, and it worked, it, it worked. And now everybody in baseball is like deep diving into analytics. And of course we are in the industry as well. Um, so in the article, you know, I'm not going to go through all the Excel stuff because I do barely good enough on Excel on my own. <laughs> but how, obviously, you, you said so far that, that the game hasn't done as well as you had hoped, but how did it do compared to what you were aiming for? It did about the same. So part of the analysis is I can see there's like a floor to what the games that I produce. Like the last two games that I've made hit about the same level. They hit about the same income level, the same uptake, the same amount. And so I kind of know that's the baseline that I can kind of hit. If uh, I, I don't consider the two games that I've made really uh, finding that product market fit on their own. And so what I can do is when I was looking at the analysis, I know my community that I've built and my marketing strategies can hit this kind of like base level. And so when I was doing my competitive analysis, I was kind of starting at that base level and saying, okay, I'm gonna look at all the games above this now. Cause I'll, I, I, I could cut that. The median was pretty close to what I hit. The, if I look at the median of roguelikes 2D on Steam, I'm hitting about the median. So now I can just look at that upper percentage and say like, oh, okay, uh, I know my base community can at least kind of strive for this level when I don't have product market fit, which is what I feel like my last two games have not achieved is product market fit. All right, so let's jump to the next half of this, you know, and, and when you're doing the competitive analysis, and this is something that I see developers have a lot of trouble with, and, and we talk about you know, the difference between a feature and a unique selling point. But those unique selling points are also, you know, what you refer to as the anchor of the game. So let's talk a little bit about that and, you know, how you figure it out, how you build around it, you know, where does this fit into that competitive analysis that you're doing, you know, hopefully before you start making a game? Sure, absolutely. So what I did was, after I got that set of games, I identified 20 games that I was going to, like, deep dive on. So I've, I, I've got 600 games, and then I lopped off everything that made more than, like, a million dollars, and I lopped off everything that made less than $5,000. And so I had the smaller set. And so then I looked at games that were very similar, looking to the type of game I like to make and similar play style, and I eliminated it. I, I boiled it down to about 20 games there. So I had a list of 20 games that were kind of my test case. And what I did with those 20 games is I looked at the reviews for them. And I, because on my last chat, I mentioned, the last time I was on this, and I shop. walked off, I mentioned that I did a, a analysis of how people look at Steam. Like I followed people around as they shop. And the reviews are very important to whether they judge whether they like a game. The other thing that's very important is genre. Like in other words, a lot of people that I would study as they browse Steam would say, oh, I don't like that type of game. Or people said, oh, I don't like Metroidvanias because they're too hard. Like, they would say the genre. They'd say, this is a Metroidvania, or this is a roguelite, or this is a, a story-based game. They knew their genre very well. And when I looked at the reviews for these 20 test case games I was looking at, I would see a lot of reviews that would say, hey, this roguelite doesn't have this feature. And they would point it out. And, they, and then I'd look at other negative reviews, and they'd point out the same kind of, like, trope. You would almost say, like, a movie trope, you know, like, Oh, uh, guy gets girl by crashing the, you know, her wedding or something. You know, that's like a trope of romantic comedies. But they'd always quote in the review a trope of roguelites, like, hey, there's no upgrade mechanic when you die. And it's like, oh, that's a thing. Okay. So I kept seeing these same little tropes show up in all these negative reviews. And that's what I call an anchor. It's every genre has a set of tropes. Like I mentioned, like a romantic comedy has the guy tries to get the girl on the wedding. They go on an awkward first date. They go on a romantic second date. Then they have like a, you know, a breaking up. Like every, every piece of medium has a genre and the genre expectations. And what I call those are anchors. Like people expect that baseline if you're going to have a genre. Now the hook that a lot of, 
Indies are all about the, the hook. We talk about that a lot. There's been a lot of great articles. That's super important. That's called a unique selling proposition. That's the thing that makes your game unique. But I think a lot of Indies have taken that way too far. And their game is none about hooks. And so people are like, what kind of game? I don't even know what, this is just like some weird abstract hook machine. You know, it's just like a ball of hooks. And you're like, I don't even know how to enter in this thing. Because a lot of people will, they look at the, most people actually, look at a game and like, oh, it's this genre that I love. Oh, and it's got this weird side thing. And that's that hook that they look at. And so the what I want- The one rule. Yeah, yeah. You've got to combine some well-known things with some something interesting. And so that's what we got to also pay attention to is know your hook, but also know the anchors and the tropes of the genre, because that's going to help you when you're designing your game. And if you look through when you do your competitive analysis, look through your views. You're going to see the same things mentioned. Like I was looking at Metroid game. It's like, you got to have a map. And a lot of people were leaving negative reviews like this game does not have a map. And it's like, the map is an anchor of the Metroidvania genre. Like, if you play Super Metroid, it's got a great map, it's got little dots where things are. That's very important to that genre. So you gotta know the anchors that I'm calling. That's just my term, I just made that up. I don't know if it's a good term, it made it work. <laughs> but though, you gotta know what those are so that you can play to that genre. Because if you're too weird, if you got too many hooks, there's nothing for somebody to kind of like anchor onto. So, the, the, and, and... Adding on to that, the six three one rule is you when you're planning out your game, you do sixty percent of something that is very familiar to the you know consumer, and that's your genre basically. You're doing a roguelike. Then you do thirty percent of things that have been done before, but you're doing them better. So your upgrade mechanic in between levels or whatever is better, or your map is more interactive, whatever it is, you, you're, you're looking at your competitive titles and you're improving upon an aspect that's already in there. And then 10% of the game is something that's completely new off the, off the charts, no one's done it before, you know, that sort of stuff. I've never heard that, Where's that where does that come from? Uh, marketing people. That's I, <laughs> them. It comes from them. It. Don't ask me. Those this. guys. So, it's, it comes from had, them. No, I think it's great, and that's why I did this kind of competitive analysis and looking at anchors because there's so much. It's so hard to have like, where do I even start? And you can kind of say like, oh yeah, okay, we've got these six, and you don't have to be six three one like exact or whatever, you know. But to have that kind of baseline, I think that's excellent. To kind of, I always like to kind of anchor on it and kind of say like. Oh, okay, I've got enough here. I think this is pretty good. It's good ratio. Like it's it's in the ballpark of it, you know? I think that's a that's a great idea. I'll look that up. I, I hadn't heard of that. I'll I'll have to find it. We had um a friend of mine, Nicholas and, and his partner on like early in the aspects of this show. And that's one of the things that they were talking about. And they come from a very deep marketing, you know, background. So, but it, it's, it's very true. That's what we always see. You have to, you have to stage on this stuff because you're going through there. Um, it looks like we got half a question in there from Ted or more. I don't know what the actual question is. So we're just going to skip that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, when you're talking about the anchors in, in the article, you know, you're bringing up the different types of marketing folks as well. Um, I lost my article. Oh yeah, like with the friends and the influencers, and you know, have people played things that are a related experience? You know, how did you apply that to you know your latest title? So um, now all this, uh, one thing, that, the other aspect, how do people find out about games and how do they do it? And a big, big thing are their friends. Now, um, and there's a couple things, there's a couple reasons why people will buy games is their friends played it, they played a game, the earlier game in the genre, like they played the game, the first one, and this is the second one. So if this is the second game in the genre or in the series, like this is a sequel, they're like, oh yeah, I played the first one, that's great. That's an anchor for them. Uh, the third one might be like, oh, this is um, by the same studio or the brand is well known. I like the studio's first game. Oh, I bet they've got the same quality. So you've, you have to have these things. Now, with my games, like part of it is I am going to make a sequel to my first game, which was one screen platformer. I'm going to make a sequel to that. And that's going to be an anchor for that game. It's like, oh, yeah, I played the first one. 
And I was just recently in a Humble Bundle, so I have a bunch of people who have played that first one, and now that I'm going to release a second one, a lot of people are going to say, oh, yeah, I played that first one. I'm going to buy the second one. And so I think part of it is we got to stick around. We either, one, follow Jay's and guide and get some good publishers, because that's a good way to get an name. It's like if you get a good publisher that has a good track record, a lot of people are going to be more favorable to your game because it's with a publisher that's an anchor to say, I trust this publisher's games, or you release a sequel to your game. And so part of it is we just got to stick around long enough making games so that we establish that that base so that we have an anchor. We become an anchor just by putting out more games. And that's part of one of my chief strategies that I'm going for is, yes, I just released two games and they didn't sell as well, but I'm established. I know that I'm doing that sweat equity to like build up my brand, build up my name. I think they're underperforming. I think they could do better, but I'm, I'm willing to play the long game where if I release more, they're going to go, people are going to go into my back catalog and play those games. So I think just building a good platform is, is an important aspect of it. It is. And, and, and so it's not, a, you, you wrapped it up pretty nicely. I had a thought in there, but then you, you covered it. It's as, blue as, right you, over. It's, it's as you, as you continue to release this stuff, it is, people are going to go back and play your old games. And especially for indie devs, it's that long tail of sales. that's going to make all the difference in the world, you know, because, and, and we talk about that in, in a lot of different ways with, with the work that we do, but you've got to have more stuff out there. And then the more stuff you get out there, the more you can cross market these things. That's the reason that all, you know, we started off talking about Rovio and the reason they can continue to put out you know, all of these games is because they have all these people that are playing Angry Birds. And, you know, when you're playing, they're playing Angry Birds, you simply just say, hey, look, here's this other game that we have. And, you know, it's it's that type of stuff that gets you in there. And, and it's the repetition and, you know, it's awareness and all of these very basic marketing things that we don't really think of all the time in the game industry. And we may call them something different, but that's what it is. You're building brand awareness. Yep. Yep. I, I just don't, I think one of the big problems is indies just don't stick around long enough. Like, I think we expect if our game doesn't go gangbusters the first time, we're done. Like, that's it. Close up shop. You know, it's like one analogy I like to say is like if a restaurant opens and it's a brand new restaurant, their first night is not going to be awesome. <laughs> you know, unless it's like, like, a big brand like Wolfgang Puck or something. But again, he's had several restaurants. But if it's if you're your first night opening a restaurant, it's going to be like empty tables all over the place. But you don't close up shop that night. <laughs> you're like, you open again and again, and people come back and they bring their friends and then they bring their dates and then they do all... You slow build this stuff. It's We're running a business just like anybody else. It's like some mom and pop Chinese restaurant or something. You got you to gotta keep the doors open so that people come back, you know? So, and, and I want to touch on what, what Andy said as well, you know, and, and it's very important to be doing these deep dives into your competition. And it's one of those things that I laugh and, you know, people, you know, I talk to them, they're like, what you do today? And I was like, well, I was playing some games. They're like, oh, that's all you do is play games all day. And it's like, no, it's not. But <laughs> in some cases it is because you really do have to get in and understand what works in a game and what doesn't you know there was a term we used to use for best in breed that's what we called them and so you know we would sit down and if we have a client come in i still do this to this day if we have a client that comes in with a resource management game you know i sit down and we go through and we play a bunch of resource management games to see what works and what doesn't and you got to take notes and it's it's perfectly fine to rely on reviews every now and then but at the end of the day that's somebody else's opinion and that opinion is not going to be you know carried by everyone it needs to be taken into account but it's not the end all be all and you can sit down and watch your competitors on on steam i mean on steam oh no well you can technically on on twitch or you know when people are streaming the games because as a developer if you want to talk about free access to you know focus group testing Watch somebody play a game, you know, online, and and the good streamers are are talking about it the whole time. It's like I'm doing yeah. this, or I don't like this, and that is a treasure trove of info that you've got there. But it is extremely important to get in, and if you're doing a game, c 
constantly playing the games that are genre specific and then genre adjacent to what you're doing because it's you know it's not just if you're doing a real a, a whatever like a, a strategy game you need to be doing you need to be looking at simulations and you need to be looking at rpgs because there's aspects of all that stuff that comes in and the more you understand it the better you're going to be able to make your game and absolutely yeah i and part of the thing is you should also let when i did the competitive analysis i looked at a lot of games that underperformed you know people always say like like dead cells is the top rogue like 2d platformer people are like oh i want to be that game so they'll play that game but you should play the games that didn't work and i played some of the ones that didn't perform well and they missed those aspects that you're talking about where it's like oh man they didn't implement this feature that's a, a critical aspect of the genre this is a critical aspect of the genre these people just didn't understand the game that they were building for the audience you know this is what the market wants and they missed those key features and if you play those games and watch those streamers you're going to kind of learn what those kind of subtle anchors as i call them are you're going to learn what those tropes are so it's along that same line so let's use that same analogy if we're doing a, a roguelike you know platformer you need to be playing games like ftl it's a roguelike but it's not necessarily a platformer it's more of a rpg simulation i'm not real sure where you file ftl but it's its own know, thing now ftl is its own genre like See, Talk yeah, and that's it. <laughs> it's like, how did we take a roguelike and we morphed it into another, and, and FTL is a whole different genre. But it it's that type of stuff that you need to be doing. And you can't get wrapped around the fact that you're not working, you're sitting here playing this game, because that is part of your work. Because if you don't understand... <clears throat> the nuances of why something worked and why something didn't work, you're not going to be able to build that success into your own title. Yeah. So what, what, what do we want to hit on next? Because we're like on, on a roll here. Um, oh, I, you know, I wanted a little, can we talk about fun factor a little bit? You know, games don't have to be fun. Andy. Fun they don't have yeah. to be fun. Well, fun factor is like one of those things that sometimes you just can't explain it. You know what I mean? You will play a game and you'll be like, this does not feel fun, you know. And there's like, not. I keep playing Dark Souls. You, you can't. You can't. Dark Souls is fun. <laughs> but there's like so. There's like first person shooters, for example. You look at a game and you'll check it out. This is gorgeous, but then you play it and it just doesn't feel right. You know what I mean? And it just you you got to figure out. It, yes, it has the same mechanics as this other first person shooter that is really fun and it looks amazing, but. You have to figure out and go, you have to break down in your brain why, what exactly is the reason this is not fun? And a lot of the times it's so hard to do that. It's, it's easy to look at numbers and say, yeah, this doesn't have this exact feature. But when you play something that's the same, this, the same type exactly as something else, but this one's fun and this one's not, like, how, how do you process that with your, how do you process that with your brain? Well, it, and it's also the fact that we've got so many games out there and we have so many creative people in the industry that we're building subsets. It's like, I'll sit down every now and then and go, I want to play a shooter. And it's like, do I want to play Fortnite with my son, which is, or, you know, by myself, or do I want to play something like Overwatch, which is now called what the hero class of shooters or do I want to do something more strategic and play one of the sniper games or do I just want to blow the shit out of stuff and play doom? And so, you know, right there, if you're building a shooter, there's four completely different tracks of, of genre that you could go down and you've got to understand why this one is fun versus why the other one was fun or not. It's, it it really is, and, and I tell this to kids when I'm talking at, at a high school or, or a college, and they're like, "I don't, I want to get into games, but I don't know what I want to do yet." You know, what should I be working on? And I tell them, "Your parents aren't going to want to hear this, but you need to play a lot of games, <laughs> and you need to play games that you don't normally play, and that's not just video games. You need to be playing, you know." board games as well we got our son the funko verse with the board game for christmas and 
you know, it's like most board games. When you sit down to play a board game, there's not like a tutorial. You have to read a manual and it's not always clear. And it's usually, but once you play it, it gets easier. And so he and I, you know, tried to get into it, but he couldn't really, he wasn't feeling it (laughs) until I went and played it with some friends of mine. And I came back and I went, buddy, this game is just like Mario versus rabbits. You know, it's 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 that mentality because he hadn't played XCOM. Otherwise, I would say hey, it's it's an XCOM game. But yeah. you know, you're able to sit down and say, okay, this is the aspect of you know a video game that they brought to a board game, or this is the aspect of a board game somebody brought to a video game. And if you can understand that, it's going to be a you know a huge huge benefit. Yeah, I, absolutely. I think, and that's part of the, the Steam research that I was on for last time, was people, what you said, Mario versus Rabbits, that is such the way that people talk about it. They find the number one game in that super subgenre. Like, the number of times I heard people say, oh, this is like FTL. Like, that, it's so specific. And part of it is people, that's good for us as developers. Like, if you're an indie does. I find that actually reassuring to know there's these super specific subgenres because I can say I want to make something in this super subgenre because you've got a captive audience. Because like you said, Jay, when you were like, oh, I'm going to, I'm feeling it tonight. I'm feeling like a looter shooter, which is Borderlands type of game. <laughs> you can say you've got an active audience there. There's a, there's a portion of people who say, I, I love Borderlands, but I've gotten every ounce of content out of this game. I want another one just like it. And you can you can market yourself that way. You can say, I'm the I mean, I wouldn't literally say this, but like this is the game you play after the but you can use that that content, like that those those terms that people use, looter shooter or whatever, and you can specifically market to people using that kind of like there's like the shibboleths, these like secret words in the games to say to signal that you are like a lands game where it's like we have ten million guns out of combinations of stuff. And people will pick up on that and say, oh, this is the game I play after Borderlands. And I think that's an important, it's, it's very reassuring from a marketing standpoint and a design standpoint when I can say, okay, this is what my target is. What I want to know is, so FTL is the go-to, like this game is like FTL. That's the go-to for that genre, right? So when FTL first came out, what did people say this game is like? That's that's a very big question. Like that's that's very hard and... This is, I think, this is just personally, I don't want to be that game that's FTL. I don't want to be, this is just my business strategy. This is who I am. I don't want to be the avant-garde. I don't want to be the edge. Now, a lot of indies want to be that. And that's su- just, I, I just want to emphasize, you can do that. It is just super risky. <laughs> like, it's very, very, is. very, very hit and miss. Very hit or miss. I mean, the there, chances are it will be a game that nobody understands. Exactly. And then have you guys played will... Dream Quest? I, I don't no. know. I've heard of Dream Quest. I've heard of Dream Quest. I've never played it. Nobody has. I tried to play it and I was like, what the hell? It's, it is the game that innovated Path of Exile, you know, the, the, the card collectible card game, like Path of Exile and everything. Nobody remembers it because only designers played it. It's like, um, it's like the Velvet Underground. They always said, like, nobody listened to Velvet Underground, but Velvet Underground inspired all these other bands. And that's the thing is like to be that FTL or that, uh, uh, you know, like Path of Exile and stuff. It's it's really hard to be that game, and you're gonna you're gonna strike out so many times just so that you can be the chief thing. I think it's from me, just me, from a business standpoint, it's much easier to be the number two than it is to be the number one. <laughs> like that's just hey, that, but- call me a shill or anything, but I I don't know. I just find it's. I, it's so hard. You never know if you're going to be that lightning in a bottle that is that genre defining game. I just, I, I don't have the stomach for it. I'm too old. I'm too old right. for that stuff. But let, let's look. There is a absolute perfect example of that company that was always happy to be number two and they nailed it until very recently. But Blizzard. Blizzard. That's what I was going to say. It is Blizzard. B- Blizzard didn't invent the MMO, but they let everybody else try it. And they say they did the same thing with Heroes of the Storm. You know, a lot of Blizzard's games 
that you know Diablo wasn't the first action RPG, but a lot of Blizzard's games they would sit back and let somebody else be that avant garde, that pioneer, that creating something new, and then they would sit back and go, "How do I make something better? How do I improve this?" You know, and there's ways that we can do this. Like one thing, I make platformers. That's my that's my spiel. I only make platformers. You know, there are things I like to look at communities that have no sales or anything like Mario Maker. There are sub-genres within Mario Maker because that's a great place. Super, super sub-sub-genres within Mario Maker. And I can look at those and say like, ooh, that is a neat sub-genre. Let's make that commercially for other people so that you don't have to have Mario Maker and let's polish it and make it look good and we can sell that. And that's kind of like, uh, have you guys heard of, uh, what do they call it, Auto Chess? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That, I don't that understand that game. That's a mod. That's I played it. I don't get it. <laughs> I, I don't get it either. But that's not that's not me. But it started as a mod, which is low risk. But like here, I, I think Blizzard's adopting that. And they applied it to a lot of their other games as auto chess. So you just kind of look for these other places where it's just really passionate community that's doing this small, and you can expand upon it and make it bigger because the core aspect of it is fun that undescribable funness of it all right mr platformer i have a, a sub-genre question for you <laughs> what, what in the hell is a, a precision platformer uh it's like super meat boy it's like um you have to specifically hit specific places otherwise you die so it's like super isn't meat that boy. every platformer no no like Super, I would not consider Super Mario Brothers a precision platformer because there's a lot of slop, you know, like I actually one time did an analysis where I counted up every jump in Super Mario to see how far apart they are. And Mario can actually jump about six to seven blocks. But if you look, every jump in Super Mario Brothers is actually only three blocks wide, the gap is. And that's because they allow two gaps of slop. Like there's... You can overshoot by two, or you can undershoot by two. But there are two blocks of slop that everybody has. But in a precision platformer, there is no slop. You either hit the jump, or you don't. And that's that's what this precision platformer subgenre is. So and, and this is a good. The show, I call analysis. them torture platformers. <laughs> yeah, <they're> just, <laughs> torture platformers. Yeah. Today that we learned that Chris counts a lot of shit. That's uh, <laughs> and calls it slop. I love just looking at things because it's like. It, you know, it's uh, back to Moneyball, which if anybody's in the business, you got to read Moneyball or watch the movie. The movie's pretty good. It has Brad Pitt in it, so you'll, you, can get, you can get other people to watch it with you. The, the thing that they looked at the, in this whole thing called Sabermetrics, they boiled it down, and they figured out the key factor that determines how valuable a player is, something called on-base percentage. And it's like, the most important thing is like, they just get on base. Like, they could walk, they could, you know, get a dinker base hit. But the most important fact of the terms of somebody's good or not, or worth it, is what they're on base, how often they get on base. And the other thing that the same metrics is stealing is actually very bad. Like, you should never steal bases. You should not do a sacrifice bunt. All these things that are, like, core to, like, baseball are, like, totally counter to actually winning. And so... And when you can boil something down to like a key number, it's so helpful because then you can kind of like build off of that. And that's like, I wanted to know what makes a platform fun and easy. And if you look at, well, how far can somebody jump and how often do they make that jump that way? You can kind of like build on that and say, okay, this is the thing. So, and then you can write an article and then appear on a podcast. I, I love it when we have people on here that are like so much smarter than me at, at some of this stuff because it's just, it's absolutely interesting. Um, we got Nightwolf. Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. All right, Nightwolf on Twitch <laughs> once again. Um, with Fun Factor, there's also the reverse and has been growing Rage Games. And it's interesting that it's a new genre by itself. Getting over it with Bennett Foddy, Jump King, and I Am Bread. Oh, God, I Am Bread. Ah! Uh, Ooh, so I, the I question, yeah, the question how can a dev balance fun factor and unfairness for Rage games? At the moment, it feels like there are a few top games of the season or quarter, but no real second place game, or at least not covered fully in game news. Note, roguelike that's a, that's does not fit Rage game. That is that last bit that you said covered in the news. Don't worry about what the news covers. Like that one, 
I, I find press coverage as a, as a lagging indicator. Like, if your game finds an audience and the audience promotes it and it's on Twitch and people stream it a lot, the press will cover it then. But yeah, because it's, press doesn't want to cover something that nobody cares about. Exactly. And that's why you should do a look at the numbers, look at the head of analysis. Like, Jump King, I only found that by drilling into the numbers, but it's a really popular game with a sub community. And I don't, the, the secret to making your own thing, I think, is. Uh, like, let's say we want to make a rage game. You got to really understand, and that's where the qualitative aspect of it, watch the Twitch streams, watch where somebody rages and what they like. And, they, and a lot of times you'll see it in the reviews, um, why they don't like that. Because like one thing with a, a precision platformer, one of the key aspects is um, they want a quick spawn time. So like when you die, they don't want like a big death animation. And then it goes to a menu that you got to say, retry, yeah. like Super Meat Boy. And my game actually is a precision platformer, one screen platformer. When you die, you're instantly respawned. And you'll see that in reviews of other games that are trying to be precision platformers. They'll say respawn time is too long. So you got to kind of understand the, what quality, well, kind of like qualities help people do that. And you got to design for that. Like Bennett Foddy's game has a lot of performance and there's a high um, amount of. Uh, ways that you can do it. Like, there's a lot of kind of uh, the way that hammer moves. There's a lot of uh, range of expression so that somebody can move in different ways in that. And that's really good for streamers. And so you got to kind of understand what makes that rage game that's good. Really, like Jake said, play a lot of those games so that you understand what the flying thing is. It's kind of like spicy food. There were, at my old company, we used to always do like um, salsa eating contests. And it was like, or where they'd make it a salsa. And there was always this guy that wanted to make the hottest salsa. And I was like, why don't you just buy some hydrochloric acid and just pour it in a bowl and call it the hottest <laughs> salsa? But you can't do that, right? Like, it's not about the fact that it's, like, injuring your tongue. Otherwise, yeah, the hottest salsa would just be acid. But there's something about it. It's got to be the right flavor profiles, and it's got to be the, like... It, he would never win the salsa winning contest. He only can heat. But there were spicy, really spicy salsas that would win the contest. And he would always get so mad. He would rage. He would get so mad. And I was like, just, it's not about the heat. It's about the, like, the profile of it. I don't know. I don't even know where I'm going, but. No, that totally <laughs> makes sense. I, like, I don't like just it. buy I, hydrochloric acid and call it the hot sauce. Yeah, I love, like, the habanero mango, right? Because it's hot. And it's got that bite, but it also has that fruity flavor that I enjoy at the same time. So I'm getting tortured and pleasured at the same time, which is kind of like my life anyways. So. Yeah, that's, everything. that's, that's, uh, I hope that answered your question, Nigel. Well, don't, don't enter hot salsa. I don't know. <laughs> don't enter hot salsa. <laughs> oh, shit. I, I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the fact that Chris counted how many blocks Mario can jump. And you know, that's so... <laughs> <laughs> and you know that never... that was a massive discussion in the studio when they were doing it too. That that had to have been a massive discussion. Like we want yeah. him to jump, we want him to be able to jump from here to here, but we don't really we want to give people that slop, as now, you say. They were fascinated by this. How do you calculate the seven blocks? Because it's not like he can run and jump in the air and land eight blocks down the road. He well, only lands. It's... You don't. You don't like what? What I think they did. Um, is they would just play it. Like, okay, they, they got Mario so his jump feels good. This is how you design a game for folks. Uh, you do it, you start with game feel. Like, you just have to make the jump feel good. Once you get this core element right, you just make it feel good, right? And then once you feel it's good, then you design the challenge around it. Like, okay, the jump feels good when it's this many blocks. Let's just, th there's actually a thing where it's like one second, you want the whole jump to complete in a second. That just feel like, for some reason, our weird evolution brain likes that one second jump. But what then you design the world around it. So it's like, okay, now what Mario did was they said, if you look at the very first Mario, Mario 1, they actually have really wide jumps. There's a couple jumps that are really hard. And they've toned that down in the layer Marios. And they basically, you just, you just add that later. They didn't say, we want to make, design a platform with seven block wide jumps. They just said, ugh, that on level 8-4, there's a seven wide jump and everybody died on it. Let's stop doing that. And if you start looking at Mario's, over time, their jump width has actually gone down quite a bit because they found that people don't, it's not the challenge that Mario players like, it's the fact that they, they like the world and they like this rhythm. 
I found that Mario games have a real good rhythm of how they bounce around. It's not the challenge of landing that perfect seven block jump, knowing that you can only jump eight blocks wide. That's that's kind of how it works. Oh, I actually did a whole talk on that jump. So I'll, I'll link to the <laughs> I'm sure you did. I'm link to the talk. I'll link to the talk, Jay. I will. It, 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 the talk was called How to Make Mario Levels That Don't Suck was the talk. And it was all about that jump width and everything. So, and, and, and that's your marketing advice for, you know, keyword, you know, in your title. Right there you go. Don't Just suck. Get, don't suck. Don't how suck. Do you make much? <laughs> So, all right, we've got a little bit of time, and this is all. I hope stuff. that answered your question, Nightwolf. This is—I love having you on, dude, because these <laughs> things go in so different, so many different directions. <laughs> Do you even want to get into the stair step approach and in indie game marketing, or do you want let's to save go. that for another day? No, let's go. Do you want just to dump on you? Like, just do it? Yes. Okay, so the stair step approach. Um, the guy that designed Splunky sent this tweet out that said, "Like, God, I hate all this." because indies don't need to hear it all. And I totally agree. Like, I blog about marketing a lot, and I don't expect everybody to follow everything I say. There are certain things that are like, doing this thing that I write a blog post about is gonna shave off like half a percentage of your cost of acquisition. Like, yeah, that's too much. The mo I think the most important thing, there are certain things, with, depending on your level of development, what you need to focus on. Like, Blizzard needs to know that half a percentage of cost of acquisition reduction because that could determine whether they're gonna make revenue. You're, you're an indie starting out, you do not need to know any marketing advice that Blizzard does. They're in a totally different world than you. And so at different stages of where you are in your studio, you need to worry about different things. And so I wrote a, a blog post about kind of the general recommendations that you should worry about. So if you're just starting out, like you've never released a game, don't worry about all, most of this stuff. Just have a mailing list, Pick one super, your favorite social media. It doesn't matter if it's the best, whatever your favorite is, and make your game. Just focus on that. That's all you gotta worry about. Don't read any more blogs, just get your game out. That's the most important thing. Get your game yes. out and have a mailing list because you gotta catch it just in case you go viral. Because you could, who knows? But that's it, that's the catch if you go viral. And then social media is just so that people can talk to you. Get that game out, it's gonna flop. Who cares, move on. Then the next one, you do that again. And like, once you get a little bit more, once you have your first hit, your marketing strategies are gonna change and you gotta worry about more. So basically what the whole point of stair step is if you're sh just starting out, don't worry about all the advice, all the blog posts that we write. Uh, just focus on getting your game out, getting something to catch people that like your game, and then that's it. Don't, don't do all this other stuff, but later, once you have a lot of games, you're publicly traded, you know, like you've got several hits out on the Steam store, then your marketing advice is totally different. You got people whose only job is marketing. Then, then you can read all the blog posts. But until then, just focus on getting stuff out. That's the stair step approach, where right? It's just like you do more and more as you get more games out, as you get more press, as you make more sales. And so we've only got a few minutes left. And if you've got questions, you know, Pop them in chat. We, we've got the restream chat going on so we can see it. And, and, you know, I'm watching live on LinkedIn so we can catch those as well that aren't grabbed by, uh, uh, by restream. But, you know, Chris is right. The first thing, the most important thing is that you learn how to ship a game because it doesn't matter how much marketing you do if your game never actually makes it to market. You know, you've got to learn how to get over that final 10% and get the game yeah. out there. You know, and from there, you build on it. And, and I love the mentality of, you know, your game's gonna fail, get over it. Yeah. Because that's usually the case. You you can't, you're not gonna write your magnum opus on, on the first go round. You know, you've yeah. got to learn all this stuff. That's why we say fail fast, get it out there, let it fail understand why it did and apply that to the next one. Um, so while we're waiting real quick on the, you know, any other questions that come in, I want to let you all know our 2020 publisher list went live this week. It's got 650 some Woo! odd publishers in it. Uh, you can grab it very easily. Just go to the Powell group dot com slash publisher dash list and you can download it it's 
chock full of information. And if it's overwhelming, we do a webinar once a month that shows you how to take that list and go all the way through it to start pitching your games to publishers. Um, so that's out there now. You can, you know, find us all obviously on our Discord server as well, the discord.gg slash indie game business. Um, so, oh, and Chris, thanks for catching us live. And, and dude, don't be setting your alarm for 4.30 in the morning. I'm just going to assume you have a new child in the house and you're up like constantly because that's what happens. Yeah. Um, Chris, this is awesome. Do you got any last thoughts here you want to drop on us? Yeah. Um, so, like you said, I have a, a, a newsletter where I publish all this kind of weird stuff. I talked about salsa contests and, uh, you know, like how wide Mario's jump is. I, I publish a weekly blog post through this newsletter. Just go to howtomarketagame.com slash free and you join my newsletter. You also get a book I wrote for free. That's the free part. Howtomarketagame.com slash free and just sign up there. I don't spam. I just write crazy stories about how to market your game. So. I'm on his list. I read it every week or every time he comes out with a post. And that's why Chris <laughs> keeps coming back to the show because I, I read his blog articles and I'm like, oh my God, that's fucking awesome. Let's get you back on the show. That's it. Also, don't forget uh, anchor.fm slash indie game business. And uh, yeah, somebody linked to the talk about the jump oh it's uh so yeah go to um casual game studio go to chris's site and we'll when we get all of this properly posted we'll put the link in there about uh about the jump so 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 everyone can be fascinated by how far mario can actually jump yeah all right yeah. i think that covers it for today chris thank you so much dude yeah. Thank Happy you, Friday. Friday, as always. Happy Friday. Again, I gotta be on the five timer club. When's that gonna happen? <laughs> right? But you keep writing, it'll happen like before mid year. Jay's so, gonna get um... you a jacket. <laughs> five timer club, a smoking jacket. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll be back next week. <laughs> next Wednesday? Who do we got, Jay? I have no idea. Don't ask me hard questions. Okay. <laughs> Never mind then. <laughs> we, we do have somebody. We have somebody Wednesday and Friday, but I don't know off the top of my head who it is. Don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry about it don't just forget about it and remember anchor fm also you can join the discord discord.gg slash indie game business and talk to everyone there all right all thank, right thank you peace thanks everybody